Does your family have a plan in case someone gets infected with COVID-19? If not, now is the time to act. Thanks again for joining us. We're here uh, for part two of our two-part interview with uh, Mr. Lyons. Uh, this, this interview, he's going to talk to us about uh, what a plan needs to look like uh, in case a family member or someone close to you in your household uh, happens to get infected and what that isolation process will look like. Uh, um, with that being said, Mr. Lyons, take it away. This is Mr. Lyons here and just here to explain and empower you all to know what we need to do in this moment. So what we need to do is have a plan for your household for if and when someone gets sick, because this is going to spread across communities. That doesn't mean you should panic, but what that does mean is you should plan. So you need to have a family household plan for what to do and how to isolate anyone in your house who has any symptoms, whether it looks like a cold or whether it looks like you know high fever covid you need to treat everything like it's covid and you need to have a plan for how to isolate and how to respond so that way you can protect the rest of your family from getting infected from that one person if you do not do that the infection will sweep through your household so that is what we need to do is plan now to protect later one thing i was thinking about is is in our community, especially the Hispanic community, let's say, uh, children, younger adults, teenagers may not have the, the voice or the authority to make those kinds of family household decisions. Uh, so what advice would you give to them uh, if they feel like they're not empowered or may have stubborn or unwilling to listen parents who may not be taking this as seriously, seriously as they need to? Yeah, that is a question that so many of us are going to have to encounter. So thank you for asking it. Um, what I will tell you and implore to every student, human being watching this is you should not feel ashamed by protecting the people around you. And so in order to protect the people around you, you need to get everybody on board with the reality of the situation. So this is this is tough. How do you get everybody on board? You know, shaming them, being mad at them for disagreeing with you is not going to be helpful. It's going to push them away further. And that's that's the hard thing. How do you bring them in and help them see that this is a serious situation? It's something that I specifically have been dealing with in terms of my own family where I have been on multiple calls just begging, pleading with people in my family to take this seriously um and the way that you guys can do that for the people around you is to come at it from a position of just sincere like this is important and we need to protect the, those around us so we will never know if we overreacted but i promise you we will know if we underreact you will know your household will know if you underreact to this situation. And right now what we're doing, all the social distancing, isolation stuff that we're talking, we're gonna talk about, that is not underreacting, that is normal reacting. So right now you need to get your family members, get the people around you on board, share this with people that are not students at your school, share this with other people in your community, but implore them that this is real, this is important, and you need to protect those around you. And also by doing that, you're protecting us in the medical field because the more people that get infected, the more overwhelmed our hospitals are, the more at risk we are because we're running short on supplies and doctors and nurses are dying and are going to die. The question is, how can we as a community protect them and protect ourselves. So you need to just do everything you can to get your family on board. Yeah, I mean, if I had to add anything to that, which is, is kind of difficult, you, you pretty much summed it all up. Uh, I mean, I think it's just like, just, just show them what's going on. Like, I think my biggest thing, a huge eye opener for me was uh, like just Sunday mass. Like you can't have Sunday mass anymore. Like, and that's mm -hmm. super important for our community and our 
uh, belief system and stuff like that. But it's, that's the links that we have to go through now. Like that's, and so like, I think slowly but surely they're coming around to the idea like, hey, we do need to stay home. We do need to listen to what we're being told to do. Uh, and so I think the more that they see stuff like that, the more empowered you need to feel as, as students and young adults to, to voice your concerns and, and really get behind this, make that plan, uh, develop what your next steps are and, and, and just really take this, these worksheets seriously because, you know, like it's, you want to be prepared for the worst. I mean, I don't want to say it any, I, I don't want to sugarcoat it, but like, like yep. Mr. Lyons is saying, like, this is going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, and, and if you're feeling well now, that's amazing. That's great. That means what you're doing is working. But, you know, it only takes, you know, some sort of fluke thing to happen, really, for you to contract this disease from what I understand. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely take this seriously. Definitely feel empowered to do uh, what you need to do to make your voice heard uh and and just know that we support you and if you need help if if you need my help to like reach out to your parents and and kind of convince them a little bit like i'd be more than happy to do that i feel like all of our staff members and everyone across uplift if you need a social counselor type thing like we have a support system there for you uh but definitely feel empowered on your own to do it and and i i believe in you i know mr lyons believes in you and it's we can get through this and we will get through this together. And it's just a matter of, of being prepared as, as much prepared as we can be. Like Mr. Frias was saying, that was really great insight and uh, perspective. Um, and, you know, for me to, especially to my former students, um, you can reach out to me, message me uh, on Instagram. If you have family members that are struggling to understand and get on board with this. Uh, another you know, thing that you can show family members is what has happened and what is happening in Northern Italy right now. Because we are on, this virus is behaving identically across the world and how it's spreading, the rate that it's spreading. Um, And we are on track for that if we don't take some serious steps. We're on track to having what happened in Northern Italy happen here. Okay, so. Once again, you know, feel free to reach out. We'll, I'll provide like a slido.com uh, uh, Q&A website where you guys can reach out and ask questions as well. You've prepared a few worksheets for the students to complete. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you want to touch base with them on something else before that or do you want to go straight into that? Yeah, let's go straight into the worksheets. So basically the worksheets um, are meant to be done with at least one adult member of your household uh, and then as many other people that you live with as possible to be done in uh, a group format. You're not expected to know the answers in advance, um, but you are expected to work through and say, what would we do if this happened right now? So what you're doing in the worksheet is you are pretending that, oh my gosh, I woke up this morning, I had a fever, I had a cough, what will we do in my house? Um, And so, you know, the goal is pretend that you can't spread it, the virus, and then sit down with everybody in your family and work through what you would do. So you're pretending you have symptoms, but for the purpose of the activity, you're allowed to sit down with your, uh, with the people you live with and talk through this. Um, Because if you don't know the answers and I would expect that most of us don't have the answers to all these questions. Um, But if you don't have them now, then you're not prepared. And we need to be prepared today. So as we're walking through the, uh, walking the scholars through the worksheet, uh, this first question you've got in, uh, well, you just read the instructions to them, which is awesome. Uh, Mm -hmm. it, It talks about what the difference between social distancing and shelter in place uh, versus self-isolation, which I, I do believe you touched base on that in that first video. So they kind of get a freebie there right off the bat. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you want to like answer some of these for them or do you just want to go through the worksheet so they know like what, or maybe re-clarify, reword the question, so to speak? 
Yeah, so let's go through the entire worksheet together. If you, to everybody listening, if you have not worked on this with your family, like I just said, you need to pause this video right now and then continue watching this video after you have answered all these questions to the best of your and your family and your household's knowledge. So this video is meant to be done after completing this worksheet. And so, yeah, so tune back in if you haven't done it yet. <laughs> cool. So it says, uh, so, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, so the first question, we talked about it uh, a second ago or in the last video, social distancing, shelter in place is essentially everybody just, you know, coming together and not going out in public, not being in close contact with other people. That's what everybody's doing self-isolation it's in all caps for a reason is what we need to do in our household if someone gets sick so that is what this worksheet is specifically referring to if you have symptoms self-isolation is what you need to do and we need to have a plan for that and that's what we're talking about awesome next step here you ask do you need to wear a mask at home when you're self-isolating sometimes or all the time Again, something you touched base on a little bit in the previous video. Uh, anything else you'd like to add on that? Yeah, so if so, going through this activity, you are pretending like you have symptoms and you are self-isolating in your household, in your home. Do you need to wear a mask if you have symptoms, if you're self-isolating? The answer to that is if you have a mask, yes, uh, you should wear a mask if you're having symptoms. Specifically, if you don't, if you have to go out into a living room with a, any type of shared space that other family members are going to be in that room uh, at any time, whether you're in it or not, if you have to go out into that space, you should wear some type of covering over your face. Um, if you're in a secluded room, I would recommend wearing a mask when you can. It's hard to sleep in a mask, so you know that's you don't necessarily need to do that. But you should wear a mask as much as you can, or some type of even if it's a bandana is all you have. That is some type of covering to prevent that respiratory droplet spread. And then as well as just opening a window if you're in a room, isolating there and just having good airflow. That that is all important. So as we move on with this worksheet, uh, the next question you have is, can the rest of my family be home while I'm self-isolating? And then what precautions do I need to take to protect other members of my household? Mm -hmm. So uh, can the rest of my family be home if you're self-isolating because you have symptoms? Um, the answer to that is yes, practically because, you know, we we need a home. We have other family members that need a home. I'm going to caution though, if you have people that you live with that are older, like we're talking like older than 60, 70, and you have the, and they have the ability to stay somewhere else. If you have symptoms, explore that, explore that possibility for them to stay somewhere else. Uh, if there is no other option, I mean, hey, this is the world we live in and we deal with what we have in front of us. So the rest of your family can stay home, but you need to be secluded. So what precautions do I need to take to protect other members of my household? You need, if you have a room that can be dedicated to just you or just anyone that is having symptoms, you need to be in that room 99% of the time, door closed, try and open a window, see so if there's a window to have airflow. Um, but you need to be secluded. Uh, and then in terms of eating, what precautions you should have, anyone who's making food, uh, leave the food on the floor in front of the door to the room that you're self-isolating in. And then when they leave, you can open that door, bring the food in, but that is the that is the level of seriousness that we need to take when we talk about potentially having this infection 
in a home with other people. I have a few follow-up questions on that note. Um, so can you go in the room and check on them at all? Or you just advise them to just kind of communicate from behind the door, so to speak? Yeah, that's tough. Um, and it depends on the age of the person too and the dynamics that we're all, you know, forced to encounter. But um, if they're younger and, you know, a family member or an adult needs to go in and check on them, then what they need to do is they need to wear a mask or a face covering or something uh, in order to do so, in order to clean the environment or care for the person in that room. Um, and then, yeah, sorry, what was, what was the rest of the question? Uh, so as far as uh, checking in on them, like, do you want that, do you advise them to just check in via, like, just knock on the door, hey, how are you doing today? How are you feeling? Mm -hmm. Like, not entering in at all, correct? Yes, not entering at all if you do not have to. Um, and what we're going to upload is, along with the worksheet is also a, a two-week symptom tracking document where you can record and you you can record temperature morning and evening so not checking your temperature 500 times a day that's not going to help everybody that's not going to help you it's just going to make you more stressed um but just tracking your temperature twice a day and just tracking symptoms um so if the person is old enough to be able to do that on their own um then only communication should be through the door you should not go in unless you have to. One more question. I know you, you wanted to make sure we touch base on this. Uh, that's what if they don't have a second bathroom or a spare uh, rest, uh, a, just a spare room, so to speak, to isolate somebody else? What advice would you give in that scenario? It's such a great question and something that, you know, we, a lot of people are going to have to deal with. Um, so you brought up that, the uh, topic of restrooms, and that's something I should have mentioned before. Restroom is really important. The way that we're seeing this virus spread is also through poop. So it can, you know, get in the air through the <laughs> through poops. Um, and so we need to, if you are self-isolating, if you have symptoms, and you have more than one bathroom in your house your household needs to dedicate that one one of those restrooms just to the self-isolating person. Um, if you don't have an extra bathroom, then what you need to do is you need to make a schedule. So by that, we mean the person who has symptoms, who is self-isolating, should go to the restroom last in the day or last in the morning and that bathroom needs to be cleaned after you use it. Disinfectant, disinfecting the toilet, any surfaces that you touch or come into contact with as well. Um, and then when we talk about rooms, so let's say you have, you know, two rooms in, in your home or apartment. One of them is the parents. The other one is, you know, multiple siblings are staying in one room you need to have that sibling room be ready to dedicate just to self-isolation and everyone else who's not symptomatic goes and stays in the other room even if that's the parent's sacred space uh, if you have create the space to section off anyone with symptoms if you absolutely do not have that space then that person needs to be as secluded whether it's in the corner of a living room as possible, and they need to wear a mask or some type of face covering when they're in a room that is shared by other household members. You made a point about uh, the bathroom earlier, and this just kind of came up to me, uh, a, a personal, I guess, curiosity. Uh, when you're washing your hands, do you recommend a bar soap or like a push soap type thing? Great question. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, and going back to the bathroom, uh, one thing I wanted to mention is if you are symptomatic and really anyone in the household, whether you're having symptoms or not, 
put the toilet seat down before you flush it because the water rushing in can throw things up into the air. That's point number one. Uh, going to, you know, bar soap, push soap. If someone is self-isolating, what they need to do is they need to have their own soap that just they are touching. So whether that is a bar soap, as long as you're getting enough soap on the hands, doing 20 seconds, make sure you're getting your thumbs because that is often forgotten and getting in between your fingers and under the fingernails. But whoever self-isolating needs to have their own soap that they are touching. Well, whatever kind of soap that is. Awesome. Let's go uh, move on to the worksheet, second part of the worksheet, unless you have anything else you'd like to add. No, let's do it. Cool. Let's see what we got here. Cool. Uh, so question one, you asked, well, let me see if I can move this little thing out the way. Perfect. Uh, do other household members need to be isolated as well? Yeah, so that's you know, a question that I'm hearing a lot of people have confusion around. Well, if someone is self-isolating, is everybody going to self-isolate? Can we go to the store? People who aren't having symptoms. The answer to that is if someone in your household is self-isolating because they have symptoms, everyone in the household needs to take serious precautions to limit contact with other people, even more than so just self isolate or even more than just social distancing alone. So if one person in the household has it, everybody in the household should act like they have it and they don't need to self isolate and be in the secluded room if they don't have symptoms. But thinking of things like going shopping and getting groceries, you need to be real careful and you should look into options of ordering things online and picking stuff up at the store. HEB has great pickup options, but you have to plan in advance and order ahead of time. But definitely, if someone in your household is self-isolating, you should not be going out in public, especially in enclosed spaces. You don't need to be held to the high, strict rules of self-isolation, but you need to be even more vigilant and precautious. One question I have personally uh, is what do you, what do you recommend for families who still have people going out to work every day, uh, either deemed essential, if you will, or uh, just working in industries that, that they need to keep working? Yep, um, great question. Um, and it's, you know, tough, like, I can't, we can't say, oh, just don't need money for the next month or two because, everybody is in their own situation and that's not feasible for a lot of us. Um, but what I will say is if you don't absolutely have to go to work, if your family members don't absolutely have to go to work, they shouldn't, they should stay home. Um, and then, you know, the second really important part of that is even if they have to go to work, if they are sick, if they have, you know, cough, fever, shortest breath, anything cold like symptoms, they need to stay home. Whether or not they, you need to work, they need to stay home and you need to figure out a way around that because one, we need to slow the spread across communities. And this thing, this virus is so infectious that it is way different than flus, colds, things in the past that we are used to, that we see as normal. This is not normal. So if you have family members that are working, that have any symptoms, they need to stay home. That is, they need to stay home and they need to self-isolate. So that is my thought there. So the next question you have on your worksheet is, if you could go back in time to last week, what are some household items that would be important to make sure are in your home ahead of time? That's a really great question. And I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of people just like stocking up on toilet paper and things like that. It's like, you don't need to really stock up on toilet paper. We need to make sure that we are stocking up and we have the necessary things to address this issue. So I'm just gonna read through a great list of things that were, uh, that uh, the Canadian government actually came out with. Um, so if you don't have it, any of these, or you can't get them, you know, we're all living with the scenario we have, but 
try to get as much of these as possible if you don't. So the Canadian government says that things, supplies that you should have in your household are any type of face mask, whether that is actual medical face masks or, you know, just bandanas or something um, for face masks. Um, also, uh, if you have disposable gloves, that would be great. Um, let's see, tissues. Uh, so like a tissue box that can be used by just the person that is self-isolating. Um, this is a big one, waste containers with plastic lining. So if you have a little like, you know, trash bin and it doesn't have like a plastic bag in it, get a plastic bag from like a grocery store and just put it in there. So that way, if someone is self-isolating, they can blow their nose, cough into a, into a tissue and put it in something that is lined with plastic and only that person is cleaning it and throwing the plastic away. Um, and then a thing here is a thermometer. If you don't have a thermometer, look into ways about how to get one. Um, and it's tough, there's probably a run on thermometers right now, but if you need help, call your local doctor's office. If something, if, figure out how you can manage and track symptoms um, as far as temperature. Uh, any type of sanitizer or you know spray, being able to wipe down things. Um, and then, yeah, hard surface disinfectant. So that's kind of what we got. So just things to wipe down and like whether it's paper towels or cloths that you're wiping down, if it's cloths, just make sure you're washing, washing your laundry regularly. I have a quick follow-up question on thermometers. I know, uh, especially with babies, they have like the forehead thermometer and stuff like that. Like, do you recommend any kind of like least invasive touching thermometer or just get what you can get sort of thing? Yeah, first of all, get what you can get. Um, and then if you have a lot of options, get what you think is the most reliable. So um, every thermometer is different. Um, use your thermometer on, you know, healthy non-fever people first. So you kind of get a baseline of what, you know, is the baseline of that thermometer. And then you know where to go from there. If the person is old enough, um, it doesn't really matter if it's in the mouth or forehead, as long as it's a reliable thermometer uh, and you are cleaning it with disinfectant before it is ever used on anybody else. Do you recommend doing that as well if you've purchased a little like plastic liners that go on the thermometer to just clean it either way? Yes, absolutely. Plastic liners are great, but we need to have the highest level of uh, vigilance and cleaning concern for everything. So take that plastic liner off, throw it away, and clean the whole thing. Awesome. Let's go back to your worksheet and see what we've got there on the next question. Uh, let's see here. Should be this green one if I'm not mistaken. Yes. It says, what doctor's office will we call for advice slash information if you need to self-isolate and what is their phone number? Uh, what emergency room is most accessible for you slash your household? Should you need it? And what is their phone number? So I think that's, yes. that's more of a, like, they got to go research that themselves sort of thing. Yep. Uh -huh. So that is to the families. Look it up. Make sure that you have the numbers written down for both of those. We don't want you to have to use an emergency room, but it is a extremely good idea to know what emergency room and the number because no one should be just walking into the emergency room with symptoms before they call ahead. Emergency rooms need you to call ahead if you have suspected COVID symptoms. So get those numbers that apply to you, doctor's office, emergency room, write them down, make sure everyone in the household knows those numbers and you know can see them on the fridge or something, but have them, yep. Follow up real quick on that. Um, let's say we have younger siblings or like freshmen slash middle school scholars. Uh, do you recommend they try a children's hospital sort of thing or a children's medical center or just go straight to a, like a Parkland Baylor type thing? 
Oh, great question. And I really haven't thought about that. Um, I mean, what, what I would advise is call the children's hospital, uh, especially if they've been seen there before, call them and ask. Um, but this is going to evolve. The situation is going to evolve a lot, especially like for people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, things are going to pick up here pretty soon. And so everybody's just going to be trying to manage that. Um, so call, whether it's a children's hospital, call and ask, um, but be prepared to figure out ahead of time what your plan is. Moving on to our next question, it says, what are some things all household members should do to help prevent the spread of virus? Yep. Um, so these, this question is actually, what should we all be doing today? before anyone has symptoms and what should your household members be doing if you have symptoms and are self-isolating or someone else in your household so things are washing your hands as frequently as possible even if you're just like hanging out you washed your hands a few minutes ago but you just realized you touched your face go wash your hands right away be like Hyper vigilant about cleanliness, 20 seconds, like I said earlier, remembering the thumbs in between the fingers, fingernails, but washing your hands. And then also once a day, you should clean with a disinfectant. Um, so whether that's like, you know, a spray cleaner or Clorox wipes, but you should clean all regularly touched surfaces in your home. If someone is self isolating, they should clean all regularly touch surfaces in their isolation space and then leave it to whoever is in the household that's not isolating to clean all of the communal shared spaces once a day at least and cover your coughs and sneezes like this elbow like this get it real close coughs and sneezes like this not like this but real close and then not your hands and even if you do this, go wash your hands after. Uh, next two questions or last two questions on your worksheet says, uh, if I am self-isolating, can I go outside at all or do I have to stay inside the whole time? And I think that's one that I definitely want to get just you talking about mm -hmm. that one. So, Yeah. So, I mean, self-isolating is, you know, a hard conversation to have because it, it it's a tough topic. Like, you're going to be in a room probably alone for a while. And we'll talk about timeline here in a little bit, but what does that actually mean? Where can I go? So yes, you can go outside if you are not coming into contact with anyone else in your household. So I would advise if you want to go outside and have some like you time while isolating, you get all the family members to go into the other room, close the door, then you can go outside. Uh, but you should w once again wear a mask while you're walking through the living room or the shared spaces. You can go outside, but do not come into close con contact with anyone else that's outside. Um, so that means, you know, at least six feet of distance between you and anyone else that's outside. Um, if someone's walking their dog, do not go and pet the dog. Um, do not let go up it to anyone else. You can go outside for your own, you know, personal health and fresh air, but you need to be really vigilant about your closeness to others. Uh, what parts of the home should be cleaned regularly while I'm self-isolating? How often should they be clean? I think you touched base on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, what if a household member needs to clean the area used for self-isolation? Uh, you can yeah, touch base so, on that again or? <clears throat> nah, we, we talked about that earlier. If you have questions, you know, we're going to supply you with a website where you can submit Q&A questions to me uh, through Slido. Uh, but it, yeah, we talked about that earlier. We can go ahead to the next ones. So the last three questions. Um, really, I'm going to talk about the, the very first one here and then leave the rest of them to you guys uh, for like keeping up spirits, activities that you guys can do while someone's self-isolating, you know, whether that's like, you know, t playing games with family members through the door or through a wall talking. Uh, and then 
the other one, the one at the bottom is what websites, where can I get information, texas.dps.gov or whatever, um, will I can, one of the documents that you're gonna have access to is gonna at least have a couple um, websites there if you don't already know where to get information. But <clears throat> the most important thing is if you start self-isolation today, so going back to this activity, you woke up this morning, you had a fever, you had a cough, how long do you need to self-isolate? Um, so, oh, I was just gonna say, can, can we flip back to the video? Perfect. Um, so this is a question that we don't have clear cut answers, but we have clear cut guidance on what we think we need to do. And so, um, if you self-isolate today, how long? The answer is 14 days at least. So that is two weeks of self-isolation. That's a long time. That's why that next question is on there about what you can do to keep your spirits up. But that's a long time and it's brutal. But I'm telling you, it is worth it to protect the people you live with. So uh, 14 days. And not just 14 days, because if you're coughing on day 13, and you have a fever on day 13, that doesn't mean on you know day 14, 15, you get to go back and hang out with your family. Uh-uh, you're protecting them. That's your number one goal right now. So 14 days plus five. So 14 plus five is what you need to remember right now for self-isolation timeline, 14 plus five. 14 days plus five days of no fever or other symptoms. So 14 days, and five days where you have not had a fever, you have not had a cough, you have not had any other symptoms, then you can go back. But before you go back, you need to make sure you clean your clothes, you shower, you do all that other stuff because that virus can live on surfaces. But that is the most important thing is the guidance that we're seeing, and I'm taking some of this from the Canadian government because they're doing a lot of great work and also our CDC is doing a lot of great work is 14 plus five. What if the, those five days pass and they're still having symptoms? What do you suggest they do? Like definitely go to the hospital or? Mm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the answer to any of this is while you're self-isolating, if your symptoms are severe, which means you cannot catch your breath, you are so short of breath, you need to call the emergency room you need to, you should have already called your doctor to let them know that someone in your household is having symptoms, ask kind of what to do. Um, but if your symptoms are severe, you, you need to go no matter what, even if it's on day two or day one of your 14 days, if you're having severe symptoms, you need to call ahead to the ER and go there. Um, if you are on day 14 and you still have a fever, but you are overall, you know, stable and not, you know, you know, not super short of breath or anything like that, then you need to continue with self-isolation until you hit that five mark. Five days, no fever, and a fever is anything over 100.4 degrees. Um, so five days of no fever, no cough or other symptoms, and then you can go back to the regular environment. Do you want to touch base on these last two questions? Yeah, I mean, just ask questions if you have it. They're great resources. I'm going to provide a resource with just kind of general, um, just mental health preservation for people that are self-isolating and tips and stuff like that. But just the internet and the your access to information is so powerful right now and you just being able to be an advocate and find the information that you need for your specific uh, situation. So let's go down this scenario. Um, you have symptoms, you self-isolated for a couple days, then little brother, little sister, or you know, mom or dad or someone also starts, has a cough or a fever. What should they do? Do they need to be in a separate room? Do we need to have like two isolation rooms? No, what you need to do is have one dedicated space for people who are symptomatic and self-isolating. If you have like 50 rooms in your home, that's ideal, but in reality, we don't. Um, 
so having one space and then um, just making sure that each person is tracking their symptoms daily. And let's say, you know, you hit that 14 day mark and you haven't had a fever or symptoms in five days, you know, you can come out of there, but before you do that, you need to clean yourself and you need to make sure you have not had any symptoms. You need to wash all your clothes. You need to literally disinfect your entire body um, through a shower and clothes washing before you can come back to shared spaces while the other person is still isolating. Can I pop in real quick and ask like, let's say uh, that person who was in isolation and then after those 14 days are good, do you recommend that they're the ones that cleans that room? <laughs> That's a great question. Wow. Um, yes, <laughs> that would be great if they are no longer symptomatic, uh, but they should still, we don't know, like if you have symptoms, we don't know for sure that it's COVID-19. It could be a cold. Uh, to be honest, I self-isolated for 14 days. I just got out of it three days ago because I had a cold like symptoms and a fever. And because I had been, you know, working with patients, um, I had to, you know, I, I treated it exactly as we all should, where we self isolate for 14 days. Um, so yeah, if you come out of that self isolation, that would be great if you're the one that cleans that space for another person who's self isolating, but you should still wear face covering. You should still clean yourself, wash your hands right after, and just be really mindful. And don't take anything for granted. Even if you think you had COVID, always protect yourself. Well, that's going to do it for our second part of our two-part interview. Uh, Mr. Lyons, I want to thank you for joining us. I think everything you've said to us uh, has been super insightful uh, and very informative. And I, I know for a fact that uh, I mean, I learned a lot, and I know our community will greatly appreciate all the information you had for us. So thank you for joining us. If you have any closing words for us, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you so much for literally just allowing me and giving me this platform to reach out to y'all. Um, really, in closing, what I would say is please make sure that you watch this entire video, and please share it with someone else who does who is doesn't go to your school but is in your community or someone who's not in your community share resources share how to make a plan for self isolation because you will protect the people around you by doing that thank you for joining us and remember to wash your hands and stay safe and if you have any questions we'll be more than happy to help you out bye everybody